on this episode, Nick Chan stops by. Hey everyone, this is Jala and you're watching episode 011 of the Advisor of Advisors show. And today we have Nick Chan with us. Nick, say hi to everyone. Hello everyone. All right, so Nick, before I pass the mic over to you, I would like to introduce you first, okay? On behalf of yourself. Okay. Can I do that? Cool. Yeah. All right, sure. so well, Nick's achievement, I tell you, is a mouthful, okay? He sent me his uh, bio last night and I was uh, trying to summarize as, as many as possible for you. I think that will do him justice, all right? So Nick came all the way from Hong Kong to do this interview. So you have to watch this interview or listen it very, very carefully a few times, okay? All right, it's, it's very rare to have another guest fly in from overseas to do this interview, okay? He graduated from the School of Journalism, mm -hmm. okay? And then he was a journalist for about two and a half to three years. And then he became hashtag Agent Nick in June 2018. But that is the start of where he started to make tsunamis in the financial services industry, okay? Not only in Hong Kong, but I would say, I dare say across Asia, okay? He first hit his COT mm. in just six months. Is that true? Yeah, that's, that's correct. First six months of your career, bro. Yeah. I don't know how he does that, but wait, okay, there's more. Huh? We're gonna get, let him elaborate later on, okay? The second one is that for the next four years of his business till at this time of filming is uh, February, 2023, four years of TOT, okay? And then he is also the youngest director in Menolai, Hong Kong. Mm. And as of 2022, he is also the top director in Menolife Hong Kong. The entire Menolife Hong Kong. The top director, which means, Nick, can I verify that you even beat those senior directors in Menolife Hong Kong? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <sighs> okay. Tough game. Let me huh? continue. Tough game. Yeah. Tough yeah, game. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, he leads a team of 50 and they call themselves BDE. And now let him explain to you what BDE represents, okay? So I don't want to spoil the, spoil, spoil the fun, I'll let him elaborate later. And his team is not just made of any, you know, advisors that does well only, mm. you know. They do supremely well. His team consists of three TOTs, seven COTs, and 15 MDRTs. So a total of 25 qualifiers, half of the team, uh, MDRT and above. Yeah, that's, that's cool. I, I, I think that's, that's way off the charts when you compare to Singapore teams. Yeah, I'll give them applause. My team. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. And, and you know what? There, there is one specific advisor that, that I spoke with because Nick came over, um, I think earlier this year, is that? Is yeah, that last right? month. Yeah. Last month, in right? Jen. Yeah. Um, and I met him and, and his team and Eric. Big shout out to Eric for, for creating this uh, KRR community. All right, that's how I got to know Nick in the first place. Exactly. All right, and I got to know Kenny through Nick. All right, so Kenny, the daddy advisor or dad advisor, he, um, he is a father of three kids and two dogs. Yeah. Okay. And the most awesome part is that he is also a TOT advisor in Nick's team. All right. So it's not like his team is just, you know, just full of young people with a lot of time and energy. All right. He's he also, is also young. He's he's also, yeah, he's he also, also considers himself young. I mean, he's also young. Yeah. But, but he is... A dad with three kids and two dogs. Yeah, exactly. That's the difference. That's why his time is like crazy. Exactly, and he's also a TOT advisor and he leads a team of? Yeah, he leads a, he's now leading a team of five. Yeah. <sighs> so another go. five more kids, right? Yeah, so that makes eight kids and two dogs, huh? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, so not, well, this is not ordinary result, okay? This is not ordinary result. And the most awesome part, the most awesome part is, <sighs> Nick, you're just, turning 29 this year. I mean, like- How do you do it, Nick? How do you do it? Uh, well, uh, like just listening to like what you have been like sharing. Yeah. Even though like, I mean, a lot of people have been like doing this kind of intro before different interviews are sharing, but every time it's like a flashback, it's also like, yeah. a, it took a time to like, okay, wow. What I've accomplished like, throughout in the last four years. I think, uh, yeah, it seems very short because of COVID. Yeah. It feels like no one is traveling, but when you look back, it's actually a four years and five years time. So yeah, a lot happened. And I think a lot 
uh, started off with just uh, why I wanted to be in the industry in the first place. Because I, as you said, like I was a reporter back then. And I think it was, I originally thought it was my dream job because mm. I always wanted to travel the world. I always wanted to talk to different people. Being on screen is cool. Yeah. Having your own show is cool. And just so straight up- on like, route for that. You're on route to, to have your, having your own show. I actually had my own show. So I did uh, uh, sports journalism. Okay. So we have like that kind of like weekly sports shows that I will be uh, in one of the paid television channel in Hong Kong wow. that we'll talk about Premier League, we'll talk about NBA, okay. we'll talk about like tennis and everything. Yeah. And I got to travel a lot too. So I've been to like Asian games and all those kind of stuff. So which is like very eye-opening for a guy that is like 21, 22 years old, yeah. like fresh out of college, right? So never did I thought of like, I would leave the field. But until like uh, when I was, uh, I remember like 2018, uh, I joined the industry uh, mostly because of my mom. Mm -hmm. So I'm also a Gen 2. Mm -hmm. But I mean like, apart from like just wanting to join my mom too, but it, it's because of like how the reputation of the advisors, of financial advisors it, it is in Hong Kong. Because I mean, I, I mean like up to today, like, uh, there are still like skepticals, there are still like stereotypes on like how people see advisor as like unprofessional, very salesy and then like, so I remember like me having the conversation with my high school friends and my college friend asked him there for their advice. I was like, okay, should I make the switch and everything? I mean, the one comment that I get most is like, why do you have to do this to yourself? Or like, why do you waste mm. everything that you have built up? Yeah. I mean like, it's crazy, right? If you choose another job and people see it as like a downgrade mm. and people see it as like a waste mm. of like what you have built up, your qualification and everything. And that makes me wonder like, okay, what if uh, I am able to flip the tables? What mm. if I'm able to recreate or like rebrand or to upgrade the image of the advisors? And mm. So, I mean like as a para like journalist, I am always into investigating. I want to know like why did it happen? Mm -hmm. So I remember like starting off my journey as an advisor, I asked a lot of people like, why you hate agents so much? Mm -hmm. And I go through like online forums, I go through like IG, there are a lot of memes that like make fun of advisors yep. and like, and so I was looking at that. And I was like, asking friends around me like, okay, why do you like don't buy for advisors? If they are the one who is trying to provide values and stuff, then why don't you trust them? Yep. So I think that's the start. And then, and then the, the heart for like, having the revolution and, and the industry is very strong. And at the same time, the heart of like wanting to prove like young people can create something out of nothing is very strong. Because as I said, I joined my mom, but my mom didn't like, it's not like he, she is like having a legacy for me to inherit because I joined her as her fifth advisor. Oh. So she didn't have a big team. Mm -hmm. she, was, she was also only in the industry for like, I think seven, eight, seven years when I joined. Oh, okay, because like okay. when, yeah, because she started off like uh, the year that me, uh, I, when I took my university exam. I see. Because her purpose was to support me and my younger sisters to go study abroad. Because my dad is a high school teacher and then my mom was a social worker. Mm -hmm. So they're not allowed to like, it's not financially allowing them to like send both kids abroad. I see. So she, she heard that and then she heard like, okay, being an agent can like earn so much more. So mm. that's why like she made the switch. Wow, so, what age did she make the switch to? Oh, uh, she, uh, I think she was 41 when she wow. made the switch. That's a lot of courage. Huh? Exactly, yeah. so that's why like when she- For the kids. Yeah, yeah, kids, eh? exactly. So yeah. she gave up her professional. And then, so whenever like she shares, she always tell my teammates that, okay, auntie made the switch at like 41. So mm -hmm. you guys have no excuse. Mm -hmm. You guys have nothing to lose. You guys are still young and it's never too late for a change and everything. And she proved it. Like she sent my younger sisters to UK. Mm. And yeah, so I mean like throughout the seven years that I was in the university and also like I was being a reporter, I didn't know what is MDR, TCOT. I mean like in my perspective, my mom was just very laid back and chill. Mm, okay. Cause she never like went on like night appointments. Okay. So, cause our, our house never had a helper. So she would always come back for, to cook the dinner. She always like go to church with my dad on weekends. Okay. We would always like have family days with, with him and also with us. 
So in my in the back of my mind, I was like, okay, I don't know how much my mom earned. Mm -hmm. Just feel like their life is pretty comfortable in a way. Like mm -hmm. we're not like luxury and every anything, but because of my the my grandma passed away like in uh, so her mom passed away in 2017 mm -hmm. Christmas. Mm -hmm. So she had to take care of my grandpa. Mm -hmm. So that's how the conversation like started uh -huh. off. Like she so she was like, oh Nick, okay, uh, mm -hmm. do you want to come over and help? So yeah. Mm -hmm. Wow, so th so that was the onset of, of everything. Yeah, yeah. so and then so like, why would you agree? Because you, you had a promising <coughs> career, you know, you were traveling and you had some yeah. shows lined up, and and uh, if I were you, I'll be like, rejected, right? Yeah, yeah. Why would I even want to do that? Like, but well, what happened? I mean, like, uh, so mainly two reasons. Firstly, is that uh, you know, like, uh, she never asked for it, so. I was observing her and then like seeing her running around like job and also like taking care of my grandpa. So I see the tension and also see the stress. And I mean like I, re I recall one moment that I, I rarely like see her cried over like job stuff because she is always really chill. She always believed that God would provide and everything. But I remember like that was the first time, it was the first time that they, my, so my parents argued over job and everything so that gives me a, like a red flag that mm. okay i should be paying attention i think secondly it's because of like the very typically chinese family mm. thing like i'm the dagger of the family okay. so if my younger sister doesn't want to abort which she didn't like she hated to be the sales and everything yeah. even though she studied finance i studied journalism so she would be a, <laughs> a more perfect like fit for the industry but she was really reluctant and she was really like against of the idea. Mm. So, so which made me like a six months of like decision making process. So I, I talked to like some of my uh, teachers back in high school who like see me growing up and then like talked to some of my closest friends. And so that's how all the conversation went. And it actually helped me to do prospecting like mm. after like I entered the industry because they kind of like walked me through the whole decision making process. I told him like, okay, now you supported me, then make sure you support me when I'm an agent. <laughs> <Okay. laughs> so that's like, I mean like that, that was a fun, but also tough like six months of like, cause I had to like talk to my previous boss mm. saying like, okay, I'm leaving the position, even though he had like high hopes on me. Mm. He wanted to send me to Tokyo 2020 for the open bake. Wow. And everything so i have to like gave up that dream and i mean like because of how tough the decision is it gave me like a very clear perspective that okay i have to do this mm. for myself okay. i feel like a lot of people coming into the industry like wanted to do something because of others uh. but because i was i know how much like uh pain and how much like things that i sacrificed like I gave up my childhood dream wow. of being at mm. the Olympic. Mm. So I have to make sure that it's worth the ride. Wow. So okay. yeah, so that's the way, yeah. I, I see, I see now. So so the reason why, you know, one of the reasons why you do so well is because you have made big sacrifices. Exactly. Right? You you dash your dreams, you cut off the, the, the bridges, you know, to not not entirely relationship bridge, but but your your path back. Oh, did they reserve you a park bag or did they say you can come back anytime or you know they say hey I mean like it's I mean like it's it's hard I mean I try to like rationalize it and like see if okay I can do part-time in both ways or mm. anything but I mean uh, I'm that kind of person that if I want to do I'm, I, I don't think I'm smart enough to do a lot of things so if I want to do one thing that would better just like focus on it mm. so I did like cut the bridges and everything but I mean as you said like, I you know how I reminded myself in the first year? Mm. So, you know, like we have th those kind of like staff pass to, to like tap into the office. Yeah. So the batch of the staff pass is actually written like Tokyo 2020. Yeah. So every morning when I walk into the office as an agent, I will once again remind myself what I gave up. Mm. So I make sure that I don't waste my time. Wow. I'll make sure, I will make sure that, okay, I'm like securing appointments okay. and because that's what I gave up. I understand. And then the badge was wow. given by my previous boss. Wow. Because he, he told me like, okay, this is the souvenir that I want to give you wow, for okay. your farewell. So make sure that, yeah, you still like remember like uh, how you started. So I understand. So yeah. every single day you 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 remind yourself of what you gave up. Yeah. You sacrifice. I'm still using it and today. You're still using it today. Yeah. Okay. And you 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 went from journalism to uh, financial advisory. 
because of your the love for your mom for your family okay so i i guess this these are the big reasons why you you, you did so well because these are the fire that burns inside with you exactly right? and, and you want to do it for yourself not for 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 any other people you, you want to you know make a name out of yourself because you made so much sacrifices and okay i understand this this just in very well with with uh you know season two uh zero zero one episode 009 episode, sorry, Jesseline Ng, the advisor that we just interviewed the previous, mm. uh, in the previous episode. She too gave up a 250,000 annual package, global HR director post. Wow. Yeah. She gave up that post, quarter million post, to become a financial advisor. That's, that's a leap of faith. That is a leap of faith. And because she has given up so much, she told herself that she has no time to lose, no time to waste. I think on the I think on the monetary side I am way easier because like being a journalist in Hong Kong doesn't earn much. Mm -hmm. Like so that's why I think my incentive and motivation is it's so much different from a lot of like even my some of my teammates too because a lot of them come in like wanted to hit MDRT, wanted to get external stuff. But for me like the drive comes from within. Mm. So it's internal. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, like, as I'm, like, walking through the journey, I see a lot of advisors, they're attracted to external stuff. So their bosses just tell them that you have to hit MDRT, mm. you have to, like, get those awards, wow. you have to get those recognition and everything. Okay. But as you know, like, things, like, don't sustain in that way because, yep, 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 yep. you know, like, how the year flipped every single year, then your MDRT go back to zero. And then you feel like, okay, I'm just running it again and yeah. again and again. Mm. And I started to lose your momentum and everything. I understand. But I always tell my, 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 my team, uh, I, I'm like, so if you place your motivation externally, then you lost the control mm. and you become very passive. Wow. Because the external stuff, stuff may vanish or mm. at the same time may change. Yeah. But if you always like, place your motivation internally, then you are proactive because mm. you are the one who is taking control. You I have understand. the ownership and everything. I understand. Wow, that's beautiful. How, how do you have them discover their own internal drive? I think uh, all the external drive uh, linked with internal drive. So let's say like uh, I have a team teammate telling me that, Nick, I want to hit MDRT. Mm -hmm. So there might be something that is behind the MDRT. Maybe that's the maybe uh, ultimately he's seeking approval from his family mm. or maybe he just want to be good at something mm -mm. he want to be like uh have gaining his own respect yeah or maybe he's trying to uh just see how far he can go mm. so instead of just motivating him to become an mdrt i would tell him that okay if you want to seek uh let's say like telling yourself that you can break through mm. then you don't need an mdrt to tell yourself that you break through Instead, you, why don't we just break it down in back to like a daily basis kind of growth mindset? Mm. I think like last year I read a book which is uh, the Atomic Habits. Yeah. I think that book really validates a lot of like what I've been thinking, and I don't believe in big goals. Like I didn't come into the industry thinking like, I want to be a director, mm. I want to be a COT, or want to be a TOT. Oh. I never thought of that mm. because I don't care like what T like stands for whatever. But uh, I came in feeling that I wanted to change one more person's uh, mind about like financial advisory. Yeah. So that's what I wanted to do. Mm. And, I, and it, it just, uh, result just happened to come because if you just paying so much attention of like what you wanted to do internally, which for me is to, uh, I wanted to transform people's life at the same time, transform people's perspective in terms of how they view the industry. Yeah. And I just keep, this just keep me going though. No? Wow. So it's, it's just different there. I see. So if I can summarize you, you came into this business wanting to transform lives one at a time. Want to transform people's perspective on financial advisors one yeah. at a time. Yeah. And, and that was your internal drive. Yeah. Right. And of course, of, and plus all the big sacrifices they have made to come into this business, let things to manifest exactly. in your way. Exactly. Do you know, like I came into the industry a lot of like, if you have a rookie agent, how would you measure his KPI or her KPIs? If I have a rookie advisor? Yeah, if you, ha you are managing a rookie advisor, mm. how would you like set the KPIs? Wow. Um, for example, number of appointments. Right? Met, yeah. And um, a, lot of, a, a lot of leaders will be like FYC and like cases, right? Mm -mm. 
So for me, because I wanted to come in like to change one person at a time. Uh, so my only KPI for myself was like how many people that I encountered in the first year and how many clients that I have. Mm -hmm. So instead of like seeing how many FYC I brought in and how many cases that I closed, I measure how many headcounts mm. of clients that I uh, have in my first year. Mm. Which that's how I've been teaching my young advisors too. Mm. Like because I told them like, even though you hit big, so you know like there, there are some people who might hit big FYC because they have a big case and then they had the one MDRT that year, but then and the next year they cannot sustain. Mm -mm. So I told them like, for me, my KPI is only about like how many families that you're serving, yeah. how many clients that you're serving. Because yeah. if you're serving like 200 families, for sure you're MDRT every year. Mm. Mm -mm. So I, I managed to like hit like, I think I remember like 60, I think 60 to 80 like head counts in my first half of the year. Yeah. So, uh, and then 80% of them are young professional. And then like, that's how I made my first COT in the first year. I understand. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, I mean, that's impressive, but I, I'm just wondering if you are doing anything else different from besides your mindset, all right? Internal drive, anything else different that you're doing when you go down and, and, and talk to these people? Like, because COT in the first six months, first six months of your career, not six months, you know, 10 years into your career, but first six months of a career, it's, it's just amazing. So how do you, like, were you doing anything else differently? Uh, if you ask me about my first six months, I would just say like I work like a cow and because the only thing my mom like always emphasized is that you meet three people per day, mm. which I committed it and I never failed it Understand. for the first six months, mm. even in, on weekends. Well. Mm. So I've been meeting like three people consistently wow. for six months, six months without like stop and everything. Understand. And I, I think at the same time is that uh, I was being very open-minded in a lot of things because uh, I felt like uh, I felt like coming into the industry already like scratch my face. Mm. So there is no more like self ego and everything, which uh, it was tough in the first month because I came from a job that everyone kind of like fancy. Like my high school friend would be like, okay, my mom saw you in the show and mm. like uh, you were on like big TV screen and everything. You were at like, you were interviewing like Federer and like, those kind of big names. You're a star. Basically. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I don't know. It's not like a star, but I get to meet those big stars. Uh. But I mean, like into the industry. So I, I, I feel like that's one of my uh, advantage that I get through it pretty quickly. But what I was talking about being open mind is that I would go for any opportunities. Mm. I remember like my agency Hela. So he has like arranged like road shows. Mm. But at that time when I was in the road show, I was already, I already finished one MDRT. Mm. I mean, to a lot of young advisors, it might be a, already like a good result. Yep. But I still go law. Mm. I was still being on the street. Even I was already at MDRT. Yep. Yep. So I was still there like fe feeling that, okay, because if they help, it's, it's gonna help me to have more opportunities, then why not, right? Yep. I remember like, I was there for two weeks and I closed, I think one third of MDRT mm. on the street. Mm. Wow. I was just being proactive. I was just like, okay, even if I spend my, I can, I've already spent my time there. Mm. I can either choose like just sitting there, like, uh, like just like complaining like yep. the weather and everything. And then you know like- Which most advisors are doing. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. And then like, why don't I just like walk around and like make sure that I make most of it. I understand. So it was really fun. And, and so I think like just being open-minded is, it's a, it's a, Good thing because I think a lot of advisors when they came into the office and when they came into the industry, they said a lot of no's. Okay. I don't do that. Mm. Oh, I don't want to touch this bunch of friends. Understand. I don't want to do warm cores. Mm. I don't do cold cores. Mm. But I told him that like, if you are an uh, owner, you will never say no. You if want to say, owner. if you're an owner, business owner, yep. let's say if you open like a restaurant, yep. you want to say like, I don't want to serve these kind of people. Yep. I don't want to do this. I don't want to do that, right? Mm -hmm. Instead, you want to like, say more yes, right? Yeah. If that gives you opportunity, even if it's just like 1% or 2% yeah. opportunity, it's like, you still want to go grab it. Mm. So that's why, uh, because I, I tell my, my, my teammates to like, for pers prospecting, you want to open as much channels as possible. Yeah. So instead mm. of like blocking your own way, mm -hmm. stopping like uh, you from like getting to know people or getting yep. new names or yep. new leads, then why are you saying no to mm. the future, right? Wow. So, yeah. So I think that's one of the things that 
I've been doing like in the first six months. So I did a lot of stuff. Mm. But I do like door knocking too. Mm. Okay. When I finish two MDRT la. Wow. Okay. I I mean like so I I still lead a team. Uh, we go to like factories, mm. like you know like those industrial buildings in in yeah. Hong Kong. We do door knocking and we ask for like corporate, small corporate cases la. Mm. Like three people, group medicals and those kind of things. So, but it was fun. Okay. Like you got you got rejected and everything, but. You just have to like really enjoy doing what you're doing. I understand, and I think you really enjoy what you're doing because of your your core mission when you join this business, which is transforming one life at a time. Yeah, you know, transforming one perspective at a time. And and so to you, you you're not using sales as a manager. You 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 just want to transform the perspective of the other person, and as a result, sales naturally happen for you. Yeah, yeah, and then you kept yourself so open minded. Um, to go for any opportunities that come, no matter where at which level you're at, exactly. is that right? Is yeah, that right? exactly. Okay. And can I ask, at which point do you start to build a team? Uh, I started off in May 2020, so it was pretty late. Okay. Because May 2020, I, so that's two years later. Yeah. So okay. because I never wanted to be a manager at mm. that time when I joined the industry, Mm-mm. like even when I started to run COT and TOTs, there wasn't like a mindset. Inside of me that I wanted to be a manager because I think I was uh, observing the managers or the leaders around my agency, yep. and I felt like they were really like, like really poor because like what what because like they tried to get people to come into the office yep. and ended up like they get complained and then like they felt like okay they they I feel like I I originally thought like being a manager would give you a confident boost mm. but ended up i saw a lot of more like getting destroyed by their own teammates <laughs> okay. right i mean like oh i shit. think a lot of leaders here can yeah. reckon can like can resonate with that yeah, right yeah. because i feel like uh uh being a leader uh, you have to place your team sometimes over yourself too mm. you have to prioritize their business or prioritize their feelings and all of them yeah. so in the back of my mind i was like i will never do that mm. because that's dumb because i would rather like go out and have meals with my clients which i can collect yeah. commissions yeah. rather than like just having lunch with my teammates and then no productive no production no productive and then you also you also have to pay for the meal <laughs> So that's why I was like, I never wanted to do that. And that I think the mind shift came from uh, what's happened in Hong Kong in 2019. Mm. So we had like a big social movement in 2019 in Hong Kong. And you see, I was seeing like a lot of the like young people coming out to the streets yep. and they're just calling for like a better future mm. for the city. And also it triggers me to think a lot of like, okay, why? There's a lot of emotions of like anxiety, mm. depression, and just dissatisfaction, disappointment towards the government, but also towards the city. Mm. And and then by that time, I'm re- I'm already like on social media, mm. so people always texted me and say, "Oh Nick, why are you always so positive and everything?" And so I went back to my. I remember I went back to my uh, journalism school. So I was talking to the dean. And she was the one who uh, coached me through my final year project. So mm. we were very close and she was also my client. Mm. So I was asking her like, okay, uh, so what can I do to uh, communicate everything and then like to, com- to try to connect Agent Nick with the generations that is out there. And then she gave me like a perspective, which is very interesting because she said like, uh, because back in the days uh, in Hong Kong, uh, all the more successful agents, they do mainland China market mm. because they have bigger cases, bigger yep. premium and everything. So uh, it's, I'm nothing to go against China, but then like, you know, like back in the days, there's like, there's like a two split, right? Mm. So the Hong Kong people versus like the, the mainland government, this kind of thing. Lah. So, so she was saying like, okay, why don't you use your agent name branding to showcase like, or to show people uh, in the younger generation that you can also make it to the top yeah. by doing local business. Yep. Because mm-hmm. back then I don't have many China business too. And so I was like running really hard. And at the same time, I wanted to change like letting like young people to know that they have a choice in their career and also like they have like a choice in their future too. Yeah. Yeah. And then they started off like having the mindset of building a team. Uh. So I onboarded like my first guy in May 2020. And then I had eight people by the end of 2020. So hold on, there there were protests 
going on in yeah. 2019. Yeah. All right. Uh, it was all over the news, right? Exactly. Yeah. The world news, and and uh, you were wondering why you know it has to be this way, correct? Right. And and uh, you have already seen some fruits of success of your hard work in this business, and you, you are thinking, hey, maybe I can make a difference, right? Maybe yeah. I can change the perspective yeah. of the young people in Hong Kong. Exactly. And then you know, like you don't have to be. You know, an advisor that does mainland China business, you can be an advisor who is also successful and young doing local business. Yeah. All right. And you spoke to your dean and your dean said, why not? You know, why not? Right. You know, you be the person to make that change. I guess back then, like a lot of young stairs there, their mindset, they feel like, okay, even if I graduated from your uni, yeah. I would end up getting a job that is not going to pay me much. Yeah. And I'm mm. still not going to afford my mortgage. I'm not going to mm. like make a like climb the corporate ladders and like and also like um, being able to move up socially and socially economically understand so there's a lot of like just uh just frustration angst and yeah and then like i, yeah. I that's how i interpret mm. the whole movement mm -hmm. that's the reason why a lot of people are out there is because mm. they're frustrated I understand they don't know like okay what can i do to change my future I understand uh, which i think like being an advisor is it gives me a lot of privilege and also the freedom of like, okay, I can craft, mm. I can create, mm -hmm. I can innovate, yep. I can like brainstorm, yep. I can do something that is brand new. Yep. And, and it gives me a lot of hope yep. and joy too. Even if I fail, at least that's my choice, right? Yep. At least I am able to have a space that I can mm. try things out. So yeah, so I feel like, okay, Actually, being an advisor is not a, such a bad job. Mm. So I started to promote that to the peers around me. Mm. So I feel like, okay, if you don't want to go for a nine to five job, you don't, you don't feel like energetic. You don't feel like mm. uh, hopeful yep. in, in a job. Why don't you just go come here and then like just do something that, that that's your own, right? Uh, yeah. So you're like giving them a way out, you know, from, from their current situation. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. Go, I think go, so. Go. Yeah, yeah. Right. Ah, uh, okay, okay. I, I, I can see how... how Things things are coming together, and and you have you had eight people at the end of the year. Yeah, just in the first year. That's how we came up with our name too. Mm, okay, this, so these eight people are your core team. Is uh, it? I think they're the yeah. You can say that they're the core team, but I I mean I will say that like they are the people who taught me how to become a leader. Wow. Yeah. Okay. And Kenny is one of them. I I I'm gonna assume. Uh, Kenny came on board on 2021. Mm. So he actually saw what happened in the our team in 2020 mm. so he came aboard uh, on board on like uh, the second year of uh when i started to build team Understand. because at that time i launched a project uh called project transformation, transformation right yeah yep. so yeah yeah, yeah on right. ig Understand. so he was one uh, of the one of the first few guys who joined yeah understand and why do you call yourself bde bde what does bde represent and why bde okay uh bde stands for big tech energy and big dick energy yeah so, so what is big dick energy yeah okay obviously like uh it's it's a slang and the reason why the eight of us like come up with this name is because uh i'm kind of blushing talking yeah, about this name. right yeah. it's because like okay pg pg18 right <laughs> <laughs> i mean like it's uh, it's, it's kind of like a slang that is being used in the in the american uh pop culture rap culture and then the reason why they use this this frame is because it's it want to show that uh, it's a kind of confidence that you don't have to boost about mm. and at the same time you don't have to compare yourself with other people mm. and at the same time it's not to uh shy that when people step into your way you know how to defense mm. but at the same time it's not like you have to brag around and like you yeah. have to like tell people that how good you are mm. or how big you are yep yep so that's why that's how uh. the whole slang came in so it's like a sort of silent confidence, right? Exactly. Like, yeah. but you don't like you don't get to step on my feet, but at the same time, like I'm not gonna like mm. just like wear all those like jewelries and like all those like trying to break around my, around. Because I feel like in Hong Kong, there's a trend of like showing off ah. in the agency world. Like you want to tell people that you're you're like putting it together, so you you drove like nice cars, you know, like you wear nice suits, watches, nice right? suits, and yeah. then like everything mm. you like tell people that like MDRT, COT, you're like always very like up out there. Mm -hmm. So- In the, a distasteful manner, right? Yeah, yeah, so? yeah, 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 yeah. And then people okay. will like be like, okay, like I don't care. Yeah. Like, <laughs> so I was like, let's let's just like, uh, try not to do that. Understand. Yeah, so, understand. 
So that's why, like, uh, we we I think we come up with the name uh, with a lot of thoughts, and then just like how the way we want to, like, uh, showcase ourselves, how do we want to project mm. ourselves in the industry. So we ended up come up with a with the slogan, and I think that's cool. So we've been using it wow. till now. But we have a more official and nicer, like, huh? Like, really? Yeah, what, yeah, yeah. What yeah. So we have like. When, when my when my CEO asked me like what does BD stands for, uh -huh. I was like I, it's bold, dedicated, and also <laughs> empowering. Nice, nice. So this acronym now. Uh. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, okay. I understand. It's it's uh it's it's on a, it's an alternative la, right? Yeah, yeah, so yeah. It's still big big energy. Yeah, but it represents bold, dedicated, dedicated, dedicated dedication. Yeah, yep. and also empowering. Yeah, I understand. Yeah. Okay. So so in a sense, I can I can see that not only you're trying to, um, have the Hong Kong young people have a way out of their hopelessness, all right, of what whatever is happening in Hong Kong, them getting a, a, a you know a degree but not getting you know exciting jobs, right, um, and then you are also creating a a um, a culture, a clan of yourself that uh, you guys are just silently good at what you do, mm. silently confident, and not needing to boast and boost about whatever you know achievements and bling bling that you have. Like, yeah, like yeah, you yeah. may have, you may enjoy, but, but you don't need a flash. Exactly. Is that correct? Yeah, exactly. Mm. Is, is that why when I see, uh, you know, many of your, your team's Instagram, they, they are mostly down to earth, you know? I yeah, see, yeah, yeah. You know, go watches. You or, don't see that, yeah. I don't see that, yeah. And I think like that kind of energy attract the same kind of people too. Mm. And yeah, right now like in Hong Kong, there is a, like, there is always like a saying that around like to people in the in the industry talking about BD as like yeah very grounded mm. they're like I don't even know what what they, where their money goes mm. because they, you don't see them like driving like fancy cars and everything yes, yes. but I feel like uh, yeah it gives like a very fresh image to mm. a lot of people in the industry because they feel like okay uh, there are certain stereotype or like agents should be like that mm. or they should be dressing like that they should be talking like that yep. so are you okay with agents not dressing up in you know formals and suits? We don't. You know? We don't. We don't do suits in I our mean, office. Yeah, exactly. So yeah. you're okay with that. Yeah, of course. That's the first rule that I abandoned. Oh really? From my agency boss. Like, <laughs> I mean, when I become a district director, oh. I did two things. First, I cut Friday meetings. So, so we used to have f five days meetings. So we have to go to the office from Monday to Friday. Okay. So firstly, I cut Friday. So we have a long weekend every every week okay and then like secondly i abandoned like wearing suits to office wow yeah because i felt like uh people would always talk about professional right mm. in our industry correct like wearing like a 20k suit doesn't make you professional mm. but if you want to be professional professional comes from your heart and also mm. from your from your mind wow yeah that's wise words bro yeah that's wise words. how about first impression though yeah i mean like it's actually created a more fresh first impression because mm. people see you as an agent yep, yep, so yep. they will have the stereotype of you wearing a suit carrying your ipad your briefcase and everything i mean i still go to like uh appointments like this with my backpack mm. and backpack. then they, yeah and then they'd be like okay wow this is nick mm. and then like, they'd be like why are you dress like this i just i dress like this every day la. Mm. because i see you as a friend ma. Mm. i only like <laughs> see you as a client right yep if i see what? you as only see you as a client then like of, I mean, like, it 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 mm. it don't make sense, lah. I want to like first to know you, get to know you first, and then yeah. we can just have a coffee, that, just like friends. Mm. And if I, if I have amazing. the privilege to yeah. serve you, then I'll give you advice, lah. Mm. Wow. Yeah. Well, that, that's that's very very amazing. Yeah. That's that's some good stuff that you just shared, bro. And then yeah. you know, like our agency guys always need us to work, mm. and they create a, and they create a trend in Manual Life Hong Kong. Wow. Now. <laughs> yeah. So Understood. people actually look. So we we always wear like white sneakers. Mm. So. It was there was a time that if you see white sneakers, then they are they are they must be BDE. Ah. But now that a lot of people are wearing white sneakers around see, the I office see. too, yeah. I understand. Wow, that's that's incredible. I I, I think a I think Eric once mentioned that uh, in order to to create a culture or create a movement, right? Like you have to be you have to be good in the first place. And mm. I, I think you guys um, are able to to create a trend within Manual Life Hong Kong is because you guys were doing great stuff, you know. Yeah, you guys were dressing humbly, down to earth, but yet 
you guys produce the results. Yeah. And that's why people respect. And I and also like, low. yeah, exactly. And I also feel like uh, because people see the next generation too. Mm. You, know, you know, like a lot of people might say like, you're just, because you're Nick. Mm. So you're the, you're the like, the only one who can do it. Yeah. But now that like, there are Catherine, there are like Kenny the Daddy, and then there are also like, my COT is like yep. Carson and then like, and the other guys. And I feel like people see the next generation and then they also see that, oh, they can be successful too. Mm. And they can be successful in their own way too. Yep. Yep, yep, yep. So that empowers a lot of young millennials and also young agents believing more in themselves. Because I feel like, uh, as I said, like, like uh, not only youngsters need hope, advisors need hope too. Mm. You can see a lot of advisors who is like just repeating what they've been doing like mm. for years without any breakthrough. And they ended up like leaving the industry without feeling that, okay, uh, I achieved something. Mm. So what I've been trying to do as a leader is that I have to sell them hope yep. that you can still be better. Okay. You can still like impact people. Yep. You can still become a leader yep. and you can still like do something new, mm. even though like you felt like, oh, that's my bottleneck. I understand. So let's just like break through together. Yeah. Wow, that's amazing. Yeah. How do you bring? So now, now that I, I realize that you you only started uh, building a team in your uh, second year or yeah. third year. Is in, it third is, year? In my third year. Third year. So you basically built fifty people team in two years. Yeah, in two years. Yeah. And then twenty five of them qualify for MDRT and above. Yeah. How do you do it? Like like what kind of culture do you establish? What kind of training system do you have? What kind of support system do you have? to even create such a phenomenon, like, because this is not common. Mm. You, 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 do you understand this is not common, bro? Well, I, I, I see <laughs> a lot of great agency in Singapore too. Yes, yes, I, I, I agree. I agree, but I don't think in such a short span of time. I don't yeah, think in such a okay. short span of time. But you, you did it in record time, so I want to know <coughs> what, what are you dif- doing differently, man? Yeah. And I think like, uh, as you mentioned, uh, culture is very important. Mm. And especially when you're trying to build a millennials team yep. or a Gen Z team yep. in the future. Like millennials, is a, it, as I'm not young anymore, right? Now the Gen Z, now my team youngest MDRT is uh, 20 one mm. So she is only like 21 when she finished her MDRT. Yep. So it was like really young. But I think like, if you want to build a young agency, culture is very important because you know like now youngsters, they're attracted to brands instead of like attracted to just how much you pay them, what's the employee's benefit. So I'm making sure that my culture is, is my first priority. So I think in my team, like uh, SABDE, at bold, which means like we're bold to be who we are. We're bold to like, to talk about our identity as an agent. We are bold to like make difference in people's life. We're bold to like make create, creating crazy results. Yeah. And dedicated is dedicated to be professional. Yeah dedicated to be competent. Yep. So I challenge a lot of them to have growth every day. So let's say like if I have a guy, I, I think I have a guy like who really wanted to like be more professional. So I told him like you have to invest in yourself to take courses, go for C- CFP, like go for like uh, investment courses, get a master. So I personally got a master in finance too. Mm. Yeah, two years back then. Like I was doing like part-time master. Yeah, so like daytime work, nighttime, like study. When was that? When was that? And I started off in 2019 September. So it was a two years course. So I ended like in 2021. <laughs> yeah. So the intro, we forgot to put in masters. Huh? We completed masters while building a 50 man team while hitting your TOT. Yeah, how? So God, just don't bro. sleep. Uh, yeah. Just don't sleep. Huh? <laughs> and I think like for millennials, like I I, 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 I have to tell you honestly, like, uh, uh, I think majority of my teammates, their motivation of running MDRTs, it's not because of the FYC or the commission or the money they earn because of the MDRT. I think majority of them is because they are scared to lose face law. Mm, that's you know, the internal drive, is it? Exactly. Right? Like they, mm. they, if they feel like, okay, we are very, very close in the agency mm. and you run for MDRT and I don't get to stand on the stage with you, mm then like, it's not okay though. Mm. So I feel like uh, for millennials, they have to take ownership. Yeah. So I you know like last year in October, I actually desell a lot of them 
not to finish MDRT. Okay. I'll be like, oh, Jalo, you say you're so 辛苦，对不对？但是不要做了。Mm. Like, don't do it. Okay. Yeah, just take a rest. You already like achieve eighty percent of MDRT, which is at twenty two is amazing, lah.、Mm. You're like so much. You run so much further than your peers, lah. It's okay. Like, no one will blame you. So I ask them. I compulsorily ask a few of them to take two weeks break.、Mm. Cannot come back to office. Wow. You just go back and think. If you want to take the rest of the year as break, I'm okay with that.、Mm. I don't want you achieving MDRT without feeling that you want to achieve MDRT、mm. because it will be meaningless. I understand. So I had one guy who thought like he finished two MDRT, which is already a breakthrough because the year before he only finished one. So I told him like, okay, you don't need COT to validate your success, lah.、Mm. But after the two weeks break. He finished another MDRT like within two months. Wow.、Okay. So I feel like that. Yeah. Sometimes the push and pull has to be very careful because all kind of management will be like, okay, I want you to be better. So that's why I have to tell you the right answer, which is you have to be a COT lah.、Mm. But if you want to manage like young people, then you have to let them have the key. Yep. At least you have to let them to feel like they have the key. Understand. Even though you are the master who is still controlling at the back end. Understand. You do know we are recording. Yeah, this, right, yeah, yeah. Of course, <laughs> of course. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, like that's how I've been teaching them as leaders too,、mm. because there's no more like top down management. It's always like peers. Peer peer. It's always like coaching. It's、yep. always like、uh, earning their respect. It's always like okay, getting them to involve. Because I always tell them that okay, it's your career, so. I'm in position is to help you to get as far as you want,、mm-hmm. but the first thing is that you have to want it.、Mm-hmm. If you don't want it,、mm-hmm. that makes no sense, lah. If I drag you all the way there,、mm-hmm. and then you enjoy the ride, yeah, that is、mm-hmm. worth. It's wasted of both of our times. How do you pick people who want it? Do you have、uh, a fil- filter process for for bringing the right candidates? Yeah, there's a, there are a few signs that you will see. First, proactiveness. So my doors, my director room's doors is always open. So you will see who will always come in. You will see, you will see always who will always like knock your doors, even though they don't have a solid question. They still want to like spend、mm. time with you.、Mm-mm. So this will be the first tier that I would want to groom because outside of every quality, proactive, this is one of the main quality that I look at. Because you know, like ability, you can groom. Knowledge, you can teach. Skills, you can like train. But proactive, then you cannot, mm, mm, mm. because you cannot tell、uh, that guy. You have to be more proactive, lah. Yeah, yeah. And it's just like in any relationship, right?、Mm. If the other end doesn't want to give, so it makes no sense, lah.、Like, yeah. It's no fun, lah. Okay.、Mm. So I think that's the first cr- criteria that I really look at, and I think secondly, I will look at like、uh, consistency,、mm. because I mean, like,、uh, you know how athletes train, right? It's not like you will get to a point. Uh, overnight, so I will look at like okay how they pay attention to small details, how they like work through stuff in a consistent base on a daily basis.、Mm-hmm. That's what two criteria that I I, I usually take note of. Okay,、yeah. but 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 these are these are who you prioritize, you know, in your team already. But how about those people who want to come into your team? Do you do you have a filter for that? Uh, I think for recruits. Yeah. Uh, nowadays, like a lot of. Like、uh, people come to me, and then especially in the industry, they will like telling you that okay, my company sucks, my team sucks, my manager sucks, I don't have leads, everything.、Mm. So they will list a lot of problems. Yeah. So one thing I will always ask them is that I ask them, how did you tackle the problem?、Mm. That links to proactiveness. I understand.、Oh. I don't want any complainers、mm. because there's、mm. a lot of people who came in and then、like, blame their own failures to other people.、Mm. They don't own it up. Because I tell them that okay, you will still blame me if you don't achieve anything, like when if even after you join me. Yeah. So instead of like okay, just telling them the solution right off. Yeah. I will always tell them like okay, what did you do to make things better?、Mm. If I end up didn't hear anything. Yeah. I won't recruit them. Understand. Because they are not a problem solver. Understand. They're just like a. Complainer. Complainer. Exactly. We are、yeah. taking actions. Exactly.、Okay. Exactly. Ah.、Oh. Yeah. So you you will always ask them about why you are here and they list their problems and you want to know what they did with that problem. So there's a guy in my project transformation. His name is Kenny. So he didn't made it. The in, same Kenny? No, the, the other Kenny. Oh yeah. The younger one. Oh, another Kenny. Okay. So like uh, 
so he was uh, he joined the industry like fresh out of graduates, mm. two years time in AIA, cannot even maintain contract. Understand. So I asked him like, okay, what's your problem? And then he lists out a lot lah. Of course, like complaining the agency and everything lah. No training, no support. So I told him, I asked him like, what did you do? He said like, I printed my own phone bots. I printed my own name card, my own like roadshow gears, mm. and I was in roadshow for one and a half years mm. straight, and I cannot do it. Mm. And so at least I see, oh, mm. he tried to like to make things work. Yep. There was a dedicated, yep. like heart uh, behind everything. So I, I recruited him, mm. and now he is a two-time MDR qualifier, and he's leading a team of a lot of people. Okay. Okay. Yeah. That's amazing. So that's yeah. what you look for proactiveness. Yeah. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. I understand. What 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 do you do with the problems that you encountered back then? Okay. I understand. Okay. And and I want to ask you like, how do you juggle between? Because now you're a TOT advisor. Okay, and you have fifty people to manage. How do you how do you balance? Like, is there any like like are you meeting still, you know, um, um, your peers for for financial planning, or are you meeting like more affluent people right now because you have less time? Uh, I think that's why that's how when uh personal branding kicks in and how social media kicks in, mm. because I think uh with what I have been like building on my social profile, uh, which please follow me. On IG, <laughs> yeah. So, so so we'll pause here for a while and say, hey, Nick's IG is uh, at just, just Nick Kid. Kid. Yeah, right? just Nick Kid. It right? actually came from the slogan of just do it. Just do it, huh? And 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 Nike, mm. but I just switched to do to my name, Nick. Understand. N-I-C-K. Okay, just Nick Kid. All right. Yeah. yeah. Follow me, okay. <laughs> and also, like, I feel like uh, after I build it all my social profile and. It takes you uh, less time to close a deal mm. because people already trust you as an authority. Understand. People already like have a, a vision or like, they at least like they know what you're doing. Yep. Like and then so they will trust you easier. Mm. But there are more call ins and then, now I think like last year sixty percent to seventy percent of my deals are from IG. Mm. So I don't have to go to for hunting mode Understand. anymore. Mm. Instead of attract people. Understand. So I think like building your personal branding is a very crucial thing for every agent Understand. because mm. people, you know, as you said, like people buy people, right? Yep. People don't buy product, don't buy company, but people buy people first. Mm. So social media is the best, best, best platform for you to really showcase who you are as a person. Understand. And as an advisor too. Understand that, and and I don't see that you you are selling the insurance online. It's just yeah. you being you, talking about your values, right? Talking about your team, talking about my life, customers, exactly. experience, and everything. Yep. And how I work through them, or how like work through financial problems with them, and the like. I don't think you have a DM me to find out more, or like. It's not. It's not. It's not. Yeah. It's rare. It's rare. Yeah. 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 yeah, 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 yeah. So, okay. Okay. Understand it. just comes so naturally. Yeah. So these people come to you, and then now you meet them, and then that, that's how you you do. Your... Exactly. Exactly. Okay. So how as as a director now with fifty man team, how many appointments are you going for in a week? I think I only have like less than ten within a month, but all one hundred closing one one mm. one hundred times closing. I still close a hundred and seventy cases last year. Oh, okay. To finish my TOT. Wow. Okay. Yeah. So. It's just, it just feels like, okay, now people come, people are ready to talk about finance. Yep. You give them solution, they sign right away. I understand. Yeah. I understand. And, and, uh, I mean, it's good you, that like you let people to know that your time is valuable, right? Of course. Of course. Because like, I think for you too, Jala, right? You know, they, people know you that you have a, you have a boy to take care of. You have your family, you have like the team too. So they don't just come in like bullshit with you and then like, mm. just like talk about nonsense and then it'll reject you, right? Yep. Yeah, they see your value already. Yes, yes. And yeah. they respect your time. They're okay with chop chop, you know? Yeah, and then you just move along the process. Yeah. Can I, can I ask you what, uh, is there a focus that you are, you are doing for your financial planning? Like, you're focused on protection, focus on accumulation or? We do a lot of like, uh, for young people, we do a lot of protection. Mm. And then for the retirement market, we do a lot of like, just investment and also like, Retirement planning, low like premium financing, also mm. like dividend payout funds, mm. and then we do like yeah. So and for youngsters, I can share a bit here. Like we try to create a thing called like a, a financial uh, journey for them because uh, I feel like that's what everyone has to learn as a fresh graduate. So our team is more focusing on young professional, and then like mm. we have like a like a 
crash course, which mm. is like 40 minutes to 45 minutes to go through everything of like from insurance to saving plans to ILP to like understand like how uh, they should be planning like their, their financial journey right off college. Uh, so, so the first time you meet them, you go through this 45 minutes crash course, yes. like an introductory deck yes. for the entire journey already. Yes. And then to slowly commit along the way. Exactly. Right. And um, then they would choose like, okay, Nick, I want to start with like this path first. And we mm, just go ahead. Like, mm, mm, mm. Understand. And then so you, you mentioned you are doing also accumulation and retirement planning, but these are for older folks. Yeah. Okay. So older folks like what, what age range? Like our, our peers' parents, like peers in parents. their 50s okay. or like 60s. Mm, okay. Understand. Because they have a bigger lump sum of money. Yes. So they have more wealth they, they can accumulate and like they can do other stuff. I understand. And and I don't think they are the people that came to you on IG. No, they're not. So how do you reach out to these people, your peers, parents? Oh, it's simple. Like, uh, I mean, like, there are a few things that we did. Like, during COVID time, I I Zoom with my friends uh, and then we do policy review. And then, like, I purposefully, like, do it, like, during the time for dinner. Hmm. So I tell them, like, just put me on the screen now. Uh? Mm. See me as a TV show. Ah. So show it to your whole family. Mm. So I review the portfolio with them like when they're having dinner. Uh, uh, uh. And so I don't know if their parents will say it and then be like, okay, my, I want to, I think I want you to take care of my portfolio uh, too. Wow. So that I got referrals. And at the same time, like I will use uh, tricks like, okay, I will tell them, okay, Jala, like now that you have uh, complete your financial like planning, you save money for your mo- for your first houses and then like you want to do investment and you also have your protection. I would ask them like, do you know like what's the biggest risk of you uh, ended up losing all your money that you save up for your first house? And then, and I would link it to, oh, it's your parents' health. Because mm. you wouldn't like, we wouldn't tell mom that, okay, I want to buy a house, so you better go to a public hospital, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. Because you know like how much they care for you when you're young, right? Yeah. So, mm. ended up, I would ask them to pay for their parents' insurance. Mm. Their health then, insurance. Uh. Exactly. So, the health insurance, and that's how mm. I started to meet their parents. Uh, okay, okay. And also, like, for the third one, is that I would sell them products that is not fit for them. I understand. For the kids, well. Let's say I would tell them that, okay, we have a new product, Jala. So, uh, this product like, requires you, like, uh, 30k sing dollars. Mm. Lump sum, mm. but it gives you like this kind of dividend, mm. and then they'd be like, "Oh, that's actually a really good product." Mm. But I don't have a thirty k lump sum. Mm. Well, I was like, "Who do you think has a thirty k lump sum, and this product can benefit them?" Mm. And they'd be like, "Oh, but I think my mom will have, mm. and then she doesn't want to like manage it. She will just want to get like dividends every month." I understand. So the guy, and then the son and the daughters already helped me sell the mom and the dad. Okay. Okay. Oh, so the, these are the different ways that you yeah, get, yeah, 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 yeah. We have a lot of ways, yeah. Uh, is yeah. that the same thing that your entire team is doing? Yeah. Uh, so that's why I've been teaching them every single week. Understand. Yeah. Okay. Wow, that's, that's amazing. Because like, like, like we say, uh, the parents are the ones that has more capacity to play. Exactly. Right? Than young professionals, than yeah. their peers. Um, and, and of course, it is also very legit that Whatever you have accumulated as young professional, the 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 very thing that can make you lose it all will be your parents' health. Exactly. Good health, yeah, good yeah, yeah. health insurance. That, that's it. Okay, so you are using an angle to go in to help the parents do health insurance at the same time help them review their portfolio, and and that's how you you can you can serve the entire family. I think that's that's really amazing. I think yeah. we have something very very valuable today. I want to ask you also like back to your dean, right? Like when you you mentioned that your dean is also your client. I'm just very curious about the conversation that took place that made her your client like what do you say how do you ask for her to be your client uh i mean like it if you're long enough in the industry then you realize that actually those are the people that the least agent will go after Mm. because everyone will feel like oh they're so up there Mm. and then it's not like they're high net worth uh, but their their authority or Mm. their social status made them like okay no one is feels like it's not approachable. So when yeah. I, so I was just telling her like, okay, she knows my backstory. Lah. But at the same time, I was telling her that, okay, her name is Donna. I was like, Donna, like, what have you been like, manage, how have you been managing your money? She's like, so busy, lah, no time. Lah. Mm. And then I was like, don't you have an agent like, so I assume, lah, don't you have an agent like that follows through like your money and everything? She was like, no, well, like, no one ever approached me. Uh, so then, that's how I see the opportunity. But uh, I feel like for those like, professional people, 
they see how you present yourself more than like the product itself. Yeah. Because they usually are an expertise or like a specialist in one field, but outside of that scope, they are like completely idiots or mm. like they don't like know things about that. So yeah. they want to seek professional advice from like people who are in the field too. And and, the, and then how? Which year do do you ask her to be your client? On the year of the process, well. On the year, the first, the first year. The second year. The second year. So twenty nineteen. Okay. So it. Oh, before you 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 uh, ask her for advice. Yeah, 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 okay. yeah. Okay. Yeah, and and uh, I mean that that was the second year, and you you had only six months of experience before that. Yeah. Right. So how do you garner the courage, and then um, because you you just started this business actually. It's okay. Yeah, like, you just know the product and it's fine, lor. No? You know the product. <laughs> okay. You know the calculation. You know the. You know like how. The product's gonna benefit him or her. Mm. They just brought it up, and then if you just, I, I always just ask for a chance, law, because I'm very confident in my presentation. Mm. So I mean, even though if I'm not closing the case, I will at least leave a good impression. You understand? So mm. a good impression is also it's already like a lead in the yeah. future, right? Mm. So mm. yeah, so don't reject any like opportunities. Like understand. always ask for once that you can like present or like you can at least share some of your thoughts. Wow, wow. Yeah. I like I like what you say, that even if you don't get the you know uh, to, to to get her to become your client, just simply you know putting up a good impression already is a it's a small win. Yeah. You know, for future yeah. opportunities, right? Okay. Yeah, I've thousand like mm. hundreds of like uh, people who rejected me mm. in my first two years because I left a good impression. Then they come to find me again, like wow, like okay. in, in the third or like fourth year. Understand. Yeah. Understand. And can I understand what what is what is the biggest challenge right now? Wow. Uh, I think the team is growing too fast in a way that like everyone has been on a very steep uphill mm. road. Mm. So, uh, and I think uh, the challenge is that uh, it's very hard for us to really uh, as one like time management and then secondly like to to really keep learning and like keep at the same time you have to keep outputting all the time mm. so i think personally my challenge is uh how i'm able to really to oversee everything and then so i've been like hiring a pas and everything but i have to train them mm. so just really seeing things as a director is so different from like because now that you have to take care of your company too like you have to like negotiate with like senior management in your company mm. and everything. So it's another level of politics and everything. Understand. So I think, yeah, just, it's just hard law. Mm. Yeah. It's just hard to, to be the overall in charge, overseeing yeah, yeah, everything. Yeah, yeah. Making things move in the background. Attending those right? meetings mm. and then like, yeah. Uh, so you know, I was once on board like of, I was once on like three or four products uh, focus group. Mm. I was like, why do I have to be there? Mm. <laughs> like. Yeah, even though you know that's gonna be be beneficial to your team, but it's still like you're running around different meetings that is not efficient or not uh, as productive as you were like as an agent. But you 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 could not reject them. Like, exactly. Like, yeah, 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 in yeah. Your role, you could not reject. Yeah, 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 them. yeah. yeah. Mm, it wouldn't be nice. Yeah. Uh, so this is the the game that you have to play when when you are at at a certain level, right? True. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. What are the things that you are doing right now that ensures that you are continuously growing? I think two things. One thing is that you seek a mentor. Like mm. you uh, have someone who is in your life that speaks truth with you. Yep. There's a culture in our team called speak truth with love. Yep. And I think uh, having a mentor doesn't mean like he or she has to like be positionally higher than you, but you can still coming from downwards. I think at a position that I am in right now, it's easy to create hurdles or create walls that stop people from giving you direct feedback. Mm. So especially if you're a high achiever, if you're a TOT, if you're a director, you have to intentionally break those walls yep. Yep. to allow mm. people to come into your life and speak truth with you. Mm. I think that's the first thing, like like having like a mentor or yep. like, so that's why Eric has been helping me in a good way because even though he's not in the industry, but then he gives me like a fresh perspective. I understand. I think like secondly is that try to, uh, try something new. Always give yourself a new project. Yeah. Because uh, I read a book, it talks about like, whenever people are being pulled into a new project, it will ignite or it will like 
excite the brain. Mm, 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 so I think like uh, being your, uh, like immersing yourself in a new project gives you like a new hype or like a new direction that you can just do something mm, new in, in, in what you're doing on okay. a daily basis. Yeah, I understand. So you think have a mentor? Yeah. Okay, and, and of course. Purposefully, you know, um, establish a culture of uh, speak the truth with love, yeah. right? So that people will tell you the truth, even though you are at a certain level, certain production, right? Like you have to international intentionally break down those walls. For yeah, yeah, yeah. To you, yeah. Right, and and be willing to tell you the truth, and also to take up new projects that would give you new perspectives and and reignite that that fire in you. Yeah, like what you say. And I and I and I I caught a few times that you read this book, you read that book. So you are a avid reader as well, I I believe. Yeah, yeah, I I love reading because mm. uh, I feel like my my favorite genre is uh, biographies mm. because because I was a journalist. Yeah, I yeah, love yeah. people's okay. stories. Okay. So because I always wonder like how do people get to where they are or, or how do people become who they are. Mm. So I'm very curious of like their upbringing. Their parenting and the, like the previous job and everything. Understand. My favorite one is it's called uh, a ride of a lifetime. Mm. So it's from Robert Eager, the CEO of Walt Disney. Mm. So yeah, it that's your favorite one. Yeah, out of it, so many biographies. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow. That's my favorite one uh, because uh, I mean I I can resonate a lot of like myself like in in the book and also like I just like how. He has been establishing a very cool culture mm. in Disney. Mm. He has been calling like his staff crew, right? Mm. And it or cast, because they want them to embrace a character, mm. because they want them to feel like oh they're part of, even they're just admin. Yeah. But they're still part of the Disneyland. Understand. They're still like making a show for whoever comes into the Disneyland and feel wow. magical. Okay. So I think like those like little things that I learned from him, wow. I try to install it into my. My team. I understand. Yeah. I was just about to ask you what was your favorite one, and then there you go, you give me. Yeah. Have Thank you read it before? No, no, no. no. You I, should. I, you should. I am a a a a big fan of uh, self help, but not so much biography. But now that you mentioned, you know what you mentioned, I will really go and pick up that book. Yeah. yeah. I've seen a few like Nike. That's one. Oh, uh, Shoe Dog. Yes. Yes, Shoe Dog. And yeah, I like that too. Barack Obama and Michelle Obama. Yeah. Oh, uh, so, becoming. Yes. Yes. So. <laughs> Yes, See, see I read okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. All right. Yeah. Elon Musk one was really was pretty good too. Elon Musk. Uh? Yeah, Elon Musk mm. Yeah, and then also uh uh I'm now reading Kobe Bryant's one. Kobe Bryant. Mm. Yeah. And then so I mean yeah, just reading biographies, you know, even though like those successful story, you might feel repetitive, like oh they mm. work hard, they went through like uh struggles and then, like they persist and then but I feel like. From different people, you can learn different things, lah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. 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 Okay. Thank you so much, Nate. I. I. I, I think welcome. this has been a very fulfilling and enriching one-hour session, right, with Nick. And uh, I just want. I just have one last segment to understand Nick better. I'm gonna do a speed round with you. Whenever I give you two options, you just choose one very quickly okay. without thinking. All right. Okay. So that we know that that is the true option. Okay. Cool. Yeah. And then after that, we we we'll call it a day. Okay. So first one, dogs or cats, Nick? Previously dog, but now cat. Nice, okay. N Nike or Adidas? Nike. Mercedes or BMW? BMW. Pokemon or Digimon? Digimon. McDonald's or KFC? M McDonald's for sure. McDonald's for sure. Traditional watch or smart watch? Smart watch. Okay, Apple or Android? Apple. Apple, physical books or e-books? Physical books. City or nature? Wow. Uh... I guess city. Da, 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 city. Yeah. Uh -huh. Steel or sparkling? Sparkling. Sparkling. Uh, sunshine or scrambled? Uh, sunshine. Okay, this is uh, black or white? I think I like white more. White more. White uh. more. Okay, I'm going to come up with a bonus one. White or blue? Because I see you wear quite a bit of blue. Yeah. Yeah. I think like blue. <laughs> okay. Blue, huh? Yeah. So blue, then followed by white, then black. Yeah. All right, man, guys. There we go. We have Nick Chan all the way from Hong Kong. I hope you guys have enjoyed a, a one hour session with Nick. I personally learned a ton with Nick and this is not the first time I sat down with him. Uh, this is the second time I sat yeah. down with you. First time. With a beer. With a beer, tiger beer. Yeah. Yeah, to Thai. And I already learned quite a bit. And uh, today I, I went deeper with Nick and, and um, I hope you guys can rewatch this a few times to get 
um, the essence of what drives Nick. Because I think what uh, drives his success is not so much of just hard work and pure greed, right? It's also about, I think, his, um, his wisdom at this age because I think he reads a lot of biography. So he inherits a lot of wisdom from people before him. And also his internal drive for wanting to transform one person at a time, one perspective at a time. And of course he has, you know, given up so much, you know, sacrificed so much um, that, you know, his internal fire is ever burning so strong. So yeah. thank you so much, Nick. Thank you for your time. We'll see you in the next episode of The Advisor of Advisor Show. Everyone go to your Instagram now and follow at Nick, just Nick it. All yeah. right. Instead Thanks of just do it, me. just nick it. Thanks for having me. Ciao, right, man. I'll see I'll you. I'll see you. Yeah. You and Hong Kong, okay? <laughs> all right. All right. See you. Bye. Bye.